Hi, everyone. It's time for our final video of organic chemistry. We're going to finish up biochemistry with a discussion of proteins. So last time we're going to look at key concepts. We're in unit five, part three. We had our previous video about the lipids, biological molecules that are insoluble in water with hydrophobic and hydrophilic endings. And do um, you remember the micelles? and the uh, cell membrane. <laughs> These lipids have their polar parts on the surface oriented to the water and they tuck away their hydrophobic tails. Okay, that concept's gonna come up again here in our section about proteins. But first, let's talk about the molecules that make up proteins. So from a chemistry point of view, proteins are simply polymers of amino acids. Do you remember polymers from the section on alkenes? We had like, oh, propylene here. And if you polymerize it, polyam, if you polymerize it, acid catalyst or some other catalyst, um, you can actually connect the pi bonds, use the pi bonds to connect these to each other. And so where there were all these little short chains, you now connect them end to end and you make a long long molecule and you make lots of these molecules called polymers that make up plastics and uh, this one is polypropylene um what else do we do oh yeah we took the um where was that section the nylons or polyamides and the polyesters. So go back in unit three, we looked at those polymers too, these long chains where in the chain were amides and esters. Okay, so that same concept, taking small molecules and make big ones, making polymers. From a chemistry point of view, those are proteins. The proteins are also polymers. But instead of starting with alkenes or acid chlorides or carboxylic acids and alcohols that make the esters, no, we start with these molecules, amino acids. The amino acids are building blocks for proteins. So we're gonna begin here, break down these structures. So there's a lot going on here, but the name helps you cover a whole bunch of the structure. Amino acids, building blocks of proteins, contain an amine, oh, well, here it is, and NH2, a primary amine in this case, not always, um, and an acid, a carboxylic acid. There's gonna be a central carbon, it's actually called the alpha carbon, and it's usually chiral. It'll have a hydrogen on there, and it'll have some other fourth group. And as long as the fourth group's different from the other three, all four groups are different, this is a chirality center. So let's just put that out of the way. Uh, the amino acids being chiral, will have a left-hand form and a right-hand form. And it turns out nature prefers the left-hand form. Natural amino acids are L-amino acids. You might recall from our discussion about carbohydrates, do you remember which version? Or the D sugars or the L sugars, the naturally occurring ones? D sugars. Chemistry is full of opposites. You know, protons are positive, electrons are negative, acids donate H plus, bases accept H plus. Carbo natural carbohydrates are D sugars, natural amino acids are L amino acids, opposites. Okay, back to the amino acid structure. Um, Every amino acid is going to have an amine and a carboxylic acid and a hydrogen. So look at the remaining group. That's where the variation lies. And this variation, this other fourth group, is called the side chain. You can also call it an R group, but it's more commonly called the side chain. And then don't forget your chemistry about carboxylic acids, H plus donors, and your, your chemistry about amines. They're weak bases, they can accept H plus. So amino acids can do acid-base chemistry. Cool. Oh, what else? Well, compare these two structures on the screen. They've already done the acid-base chemistry. 
So this structure over here, I call it a theoretical structure. It only exists in theory. Why? Because the carboxylic acid is an acid. They mean it's a base. So hey, do your acid-base thing. Hey, carboxylic acid, go donate that to the mean. So the mean says, oh yeah, I'll use my lone pair and go snag that H plus. And now the nitrogen has four H's, sorry, four bonds, three hydrogens. It started with two H's. And now the more stable form of an amino acid is where they've done their acid-base chemistry. The carboxylic acid now has resonant stabilization of this negative charge. And the amine has picked up its, its H plus acted as a base. So now the nitrogen's positive and the carboxylic acid is now an anion. Okay, so this is the most common form. And this is how it exists in water, right? So this is only a theoretical model. It's the one I kind of think about when I hear the word amino acid, words amino acids, like, okay, mean, NH2, carboxylic acid, C double bond O, OH. And then I have to remember, oh wait, but the amino acids, they react among themselves and do their acid-base chemistry. This whole biochemistry section, I'm following the guideline that you don't have to memorize structures. Like I'm not gonna ask you to draw out cholesterol or in this case, um, alanine or tryptophan. Those are names for specific amino acids. Uh, no, you don't have to memorize those structures. Instead, I'll give you a structure and I'll, have to, I'll ask you questions about it. I'll have you analyze it. You remember that from the carbohydrates, right? We had to identify them as an aldose or a ketose. Do they have a ketone or an aldehyde? Um, hexose, triose, whatever, how many carbons they had. Um, for the lipids, we had to identify the hydrophilic portions of the lipid or the hydrophobic. For the triacylglycerides, we had to classify them as oils or fats. Are they unsaturated, uh, monounsaturated, saturated? Um, we had to analyze them and talk about them. So same thing with the, the proteins and the amino acids. Uh, the two things you need to do with the amino acids is you have to first determine whether they're polar or apolar. Sorry, polar or nonpolar. <laughs> and um, you have to decide whether they're acidic base or neutral. Now you have to be a little careful um, determining whether they're polar or nonpolar and consequently if they're acidic, basic, or neutral, is all done by inspecting the side chains only. Okay, so let's look at this, polar, nonpolar. Amino acids all have amines and acids, and those are polar groups. So it doesn't make any sense to look at the amine and the carboxylic acid because every amino acid is the same. No, look at the side chain. Does a side chain have a carboxylic acid group? If it does, it's acidic. We would call the whole molecule an acidic amino acid. Does a side chain have another amine out there? I know amino acids all have amines. Ignore that one. Ignore this one. Ignore that carboxylic acid. They all have them. Let's see how they differ from each other. And the way they differ is in their side chains. So only look at the side chains. So we're gonna look at the next page of structures of amino acids. Let's do this. Um, it's asking you, huh, there is one achiral amino acid. See if you can locate that. And then as we look at the 20, scroll down a little bit more, 20 most common amino acids, um, let's decide which ones are polar and nonpolar. And then we'll, we'll also classify them as acidic, basic, or neutral. And keep remembering side chains alone make that determination. Okay, the achiral amino acid. Well, I can't get them all on the screen, but on the screen is the achiral one. Can you find it? Pause the video, take another look. Looking for a carbon that does not have four different groups. And it's glycine. There's two identical hydrogens. Okay, so this is not a chirality center. Glycine is an example of an achiral amino acid. Might be the only one. Let's see what else we got here. Um, let's do 
Let's do acidic, basic, or neutral next. Okay. How about phenylalanine? Are you acidic, basic, or neutral? Well, you got an amine, you have a carboxylic acid. No, only look at the side chain. So that might be the first thing to do. If you have to classify the amino acids, first find the alpha carbon. It's the one with both an amine and a carboxylic acid. And look, the NH2 group, the C double bond OH group have already reacted. So that's just kind of the way most structures are drawn. Most amino acid structures are drawn. These are the theoretical structures. This is how they look in water. Okay, so I found the alpha carbon, found the amine, found the carboxylic acid. I need to ignore those. Oh, and they also have a hydrogen, ignore that. What remains is a side chain. So the side chain, hey you, are you acidic, basic, or neutral? <laughs> and if it's an acid, you're looking for another carboxylic acid. I would put the hydrogen here. I am going to put the hydrogen in there. But one of the things, maybe I didn't do a very good job back last semester, is why do we study functional groups? What's the purpose? The purpose is that if you ever see a C with a double bond O and an OH, or in other words, if you see these four atoms arranged in this manner anywhere, multiple times, wherever, they do the same thing. They donate H plus and form a resonance stabilized anion. Um, they have a double bind. Oh, they, they do the carb carboxylic acid chemistry. Doesn't matter where they are. So here's a carboxylic acid. It donates H plus. Does this have a carboxylic acid? If it did, it'd be H plus. It would be an acidic side chain. Um, the bases, are gonna have amines. Okay, that one's a little more detail. The primary amines have two H's. A secondary only has one, right? There's carbons connected to the rest of it. And then a tertiary amine doesn't have any H's. There's something called a quaternary amine. It's gonna have four bonds, no H's, but it'll have a positive charge and that's not basic. To be a base, you have to have a lone pair so you can accept an H plus, right? Bases accept H plus. And the Lewis bases, they accept them with their lone pair. Okay, so that's what you're looking for on the side chain. So, hey, phenylalanine, I don't even see an O or an N, right? So you can't have a carboxylic acid or an amine out here. So this is a neutral amino acid. Tyrosine, what about you? Well, here's the alpha carbon, here's the amine, carboxylic acid, hydrogen, everybody else is a side chain. Oh, there's an OH. Yeah, but it's not a carboxylic acid. And there's no nitrogen, so it's not a base. This is also neutral. Um, let's not do tryptophan. <laughs> Why not? There's a nitrogen out here on the side chain, isn't there? Yeah, but it's aromatic. That lone pair is counting as a huckle number. It's not available to act as a base. So I'm not going to ask you on that exam, but um, this is actually neutral. Let's find a basic one. Here we go. Histidine is. This lone pair is not being counted. Let's find a better one. Here we go. How about lysine? Hey, lysine, are you acidic, basic, or neutral? Well, alpha carbon, amine, carboxylic acid, hydrogen, everybody else is a side chain. Hey, there's a primary amine out of here. Yeah, so it's basic. Here's one more thing. I don't like this structure because the amine has reacted, but this amine hasn't. Now, to be, yeah, to be picky as a chemist, there is a carboxylic acid closer to this amine and farther from this amine. So that it is gonna influence the reactivity a little bit. But for the most part, if this nitrogen except the H plus, that means the solution has H pluses flying around and this nitrogen grabbed one. Now, some of you are saying, but wasn't there only one here? Well, in the universe, you really can't just isolate one lysine in outer space. It's gonna be in solution. It's gonna be in a, in a liquid, and you probably will have more than one lysine. Um, 
And so the water is going to supply some H pluses. And so the H plus, I know this can donate H plus to the water too, and water can supply some H pluses to the amine. There's more than one H plus available from this carboxylic acid. Kind of comes back to the idea of functional groups. Whatever one functional group does, like one carboxylic acid group does, all the carboxylic acid groups are going to do. And in the same manner, if this nitrogen accepts an H plus, this one will most likely find one too. It should be NH3. These should be the same, same structure. They're both amines. They both react the same way. Whatever the pH of the system is, if, they, if one of them has an H plus, the other one should also. Cool. Um, all right, so this is a basic um, amino acid. Any acidic ones out here? Well, there's something called aspartic acid. <laughs> we look there. Here's an alpha carbon, the amine, covers like acid, hydrogen. Here's the side chain. Oh, there's a there's the Ku COOH group. That's a carboxylic acid. Yeah. Here's an acidic amino acid. Nice. Okay. Um, what else? Um, how do I identify if it's polar or nonpolar? And we're talking about identifying it as a polar or nonpolar amino acid. Again, it's determined by the side chain. So alanine, are you polar or nonpolar? Alpha carbon, amine, carboxylic acid, H. Here's the side chain. Um, CH3, a methyl group. That only has nonpolar covalent bonds. This is greasy, oily, waxy. It's nonpolar. That makes a whole molecule nonpolar. OK. The classification of, a, of alanine is nonpolar. But look, there's a plus and a minus here. That's, yeah. So you have to ignore the polar groups of alanine and only look at the side chain. The side chain makes a determination. How about serine? Alpha, carbon, amine, carboxylic acid, hydrogen. Here's the side chain. Oh, there's an alcohol group. Wait, that can hydrogen bond. This is a polar group right here. Yeah, serine is a polar amino acid. Cool. How about threonine? Here's a side chain. Oh, alcohol group again, it's polar. I'm ignoring that one because I think it's nonpolar. And you might be saying, wait, how would we predict that? There are a couple exceptions here. So I won't ask that on the exam. But for the most part, the best way to find out whether it's polar or nonpolar is if you just have a bunch of carbons. These are both nonpolar if your side chains are only consist of carbons and hydrogens. And if there's another element present, I see an O, I see an N, this is a polar amino acid. Hey, asparagine. Am I saying that right? Hey, you. <laughs> Are you acidic, basic, or neutral? Hmm. What's the name of this functional group? That's an amide. Amides are not bases. I know it's got an NH2 group. Ooh, it's not an amine. This is amide. This is a um, polar amino acid because it found an O and there's a polar covalent bond, but it's also a neutral amino acid. It's not a base. It's not an acid based on the side chain. Cool. All righty, enough of that. What else we got? More about acid base chemistry. Okay, so in the body, you know, if you go into the stomach, the pH is really low, it's very acidic. In the small intestine, the, the acids have been neutralized, it's more neutral. Um, this other I can't think of a biological example. Other places where it's more basic. I don't know. I need to learn more biology. Um, in the lab, of course, we can take these proteins out and isolate them and study them in the lab. So then you can freely adjust the pH, pH as you wish. OK, so what do the amino acids do? Right, so the theoretical structure is a carbon. And let me get the drawing to look similar. We have the side chain. I guess it's on the left side now. Right, whoever's drawing it gets to decide how it's drawn. Here's the theoretical drawing. 
um, the NH2 and the carboxylic acid are in their original forms. And now you put it into solution. If you put it in near pH seven, um, what is, that's neutral solution, neutral pH. Now in Gen Chem, we hopefully kind of got rid of the idea that if something's neutral, that means there's equal number of H pluses and OH minuses. Not that there's none. I know in titration, you neutralize by having H plus react with OH minus. In an acid-base titration, you get rid of the charges, they annihilate each other. But in a neutral solution, there are H pluses still there and there are hydroxide ions still there. There are equal numbers of them at neutral pH. And so in solution, if you dump in this theoretical molecule amino acid, um, it hits neutral pH water, there's H pluses there that can donate to the amine to make it positively charged with three hydrogens. And there's also hydroxide ion solution that can pull off this hydrogen to make it basic, make it negative. And what we have here is a molecule containing two ions. Back in the first semester of organic chemistry, we introduced the term zwitterion. Uh, zwe, I think is the German word for two. So this is a two ion. Yeah, there's a plus and a minus, a zwitterion. Now, if you increase the pH, what does that mean? Increase pH, that means high numbers, means many hydroxide ions. Well, now there's so many hydroxide ions, it can pull off the H plus from the amine and make it neutral. So P, high pH, lots of OH minuses, lots of negative charges. So overall, there's a negative charge on our uh, amino acid. So they match. That's how I remember it. Zwitterions near pH, you have a plus and minus, you have both, zwe, zwitterion. High pH, lots of OH minuses. Things are negative there. So, so is our amino acid. Low pH, low pH, that means it's very acidic. There's a ton of H pluses. Things are positive here. There's so many H pluses that the carboxylic acid, or the anion carboxylic acid, the negative charge will react to the plus and reform the carboxylic acid at low pH. The nitrogen though hangs on to its actually extra H plus because there's so many, there's lots, nitrogen still has it. And now the whole molecule is a cation, just like the H plus is a cation. Okay, this is important for studying protein chemistry. Um, I talked about the blood, I didn't. Talked about the, the stomach having lots of stomach acids. So proteins and amino acids are gonna be existing in the cation form. In the bloodstream, where things are close to the pH 7, I think 7.4, the amino acids and proteins will exist as zwitterions. And in other basic environments, gets, pH gets too high, then they're going to exist in the anion form. Cool. Uh, technically, let's see if it's on this slide. Nope. Um, technically, um, the side chains can be acidic or basic and they're changing too with the pH of the system, right? So if you have an acidic amino acid, means there's another carboxylic acid out there on the side chain, then when you, if you have an acidic um, amino acid, there's gonna be another side chain with a carboxylic acid, it's gonna lose its hydrogen at high pH. So now that amino acid will be a minus two anion. The basic amino acids, the basic ones are going to have another nitrogen on the side chain. And those amines, the basic amino acids, will then react as a base with the extra acid. So at low pH, they will also have an extra H plus. And then now we have a plus two cation for the amino acid. Right? So whatever one, one functional group does, the other one does it too whether it's the original amino acid portion amine, or if it's a side chain amine. And an amine's an amine, they react the same. 
Remember, amines and carboxylic acids on side chains behave the same way. The strangest one is arginine. So I found an example of that just to illustrate it. So not on the exam, but arginine. There it is, has this crazy structure. Um, there is an NH2 group out here. So you would call it a basic amine, but um, the lone pairs on these nitrogens are conjugated to the pi bar. And in fact, this nitrogen is making four bonds. It actually has a plus charge. Now I'm wondering, is it really basic with a plus charge on it? Let's go find out. No, not so much. K is pretty high. Um, so the side chain, no, it's a little bit basic. Yeah, it's basic. Does it grab an H plus? No, it always has an H plus. Gosh, I have to go look it up. But here, here's the main idea. Um, we're at pH 8.9. I don't know if you can see that. That's not pH, that's pKa of 8.99. Um, and they're adding H plus. And so here, well, here's this vitter ion. Let's start there. Structure two has a plus on the nitrogen and minus here. So here's this vitter ion. If you raise the, the pH, <laughs> you're looking at a higher pKa value. So there's more anions you can pull off this hydrogen. There we go. So now this one's neutral. And now we have, ah, I would have thought you would have the anion form. But the nitrogen starts out with a plus charge because of this weird group out here. So now the whole thing actually has a neutral charge. Weird. But I would have called this a zwitter ion. I don't know if, yeah, this is a zwitter ion form. Even there's a plus charge out here. So it's a little weird. But at high pH, you lost that one. And if you increase the pH even higher, well, now you can remove one of the hydrogens here. And now you have the pure anion form. There's only a minus one charge. Isn't that weird? Um, but acid-based chemistry. So at high pH, we lost the, this amine of the alpha carbon has lost its hydrogen. And if you go down the low pH, it's more acidic. We're adding more H pluses then you can put the H plus on the anion of the carboxylic acid and everybody's positive if they're nitrogen. Oh no, not everybody. Again, this is resin stabilized. It's not gonna be, because of resonance, this one doesn't act so much like a base. Goofy, huh? The whole purpose of this was not to confuse you, but rather just illustrate that acid-base chemistry is occurring. And as you increase, the pH, you, you have more hydroxide ions, and then they're gonna remove the nitrogen's hydrogen, so now it's neutral. And if you go to low pH, you increase the H plus kinds concentration, and you put the H plus back on the carboxylic acid. There you go. Enough said. Hey, those are just the building blocks. Why don't we make some proteins? That fourth class, of biological molecules. We have nucleic acids, RNA and DNA. We had carbohydrates. Last video had the lipids. Here comes the proteins. Okay, so what we're gonna do, or what nature does, she takes the amino acids one at a time and links the carboxylic acid to the amine. We use DCC to make amides. Nature uses a catalyst, an enzyme, to connect these. She uses ribosomes, right? And then um, makes, um, makes an amide group, but it connects one, pro, one amino acid to another. And that bond, this one right here, is called the peptide bond. Peptides are short proteins, really, really, really long um, proteins are sometimes called polypeptides, poly meaning many. Okay, but simply from an organic point of view, we're just taking carboxylic acid and amine and using an enzyme to start building up proteins, these polymers of amino acids. Cool. 
Um, the CN bond, the mite is called a peptide bond. Oh, right. And so if you digest your proteins, you're going to undo this. So in the body, there's an enzyme. Gosh. I'm trying to remember some of the, I can't remember my biology. I used to remember some of the enzymes in the digestive system. They actually cut and um, digest proteins. There's some that actually cut, they cut the peptide bond, separate amino acid from amino acid. And once the amino acids are freed up, we can use them as building blocks to make our own proteins. Cool. Um, anything else important here that you need to know for exams, right? I kind of mentioned that if you have short proteins, they're called peptides, typically two to 12 amino acids connected together, right? So. Take the carboxylic acid of one amino acid, take the amino of the other, link them, to, um, link them together. But then now the molecule still has an amine, another carboxylic acid. So you can continue the process, right? Take a third amino acid, connect its amine to this carboxylic acid, and then you still have this end, you still have the other end. You can keep growing indefinitely. Now, the actual molecule, the protein that you make, depends on the side chains, right? So even a dipeptide, right? A dipeptide has two amino acids. Um, there's lots and lots of different dipeptides, right? You can take two alanines, two tryptophans. You can take one alanine, one tryptophan. And what if you start with tryptophan, then add alanine? That's different from starting with alanine and adding tryptophan, right? So order is important. Um, insulin is a protein, and I got some representations of its structure. It's huge, right? So if you want the chemical formula, yikes, 257 carbon atoms, it's a big molecule. Um, here's another way to break it down. We can use three letter codes. So alanine, let's go back to the chart here. I wrote all over it. Here's alanine. There's a little ALA, that's a three letter abbreviation. And there's a one letter abbreviation, A for alanine. You don't have to memorize this, right? You don't have to memorize structures. You just need to be able to understand it, interpret it, analyze it. Phenylalanine, well, the side chain has a CH2 group and a benzene ring. Phenylalanine, well, that's a good name. Take alanine, which is a methyl group and add phenyl, phenylalanine. Nice. Um, its abbreviation is PHE or F. Oh, yeah, because phenyl has an F sound. Nice. And P is being used for proline, I think. There it is. Yeah, proline's over here as pro and P is its one letter code. So back to insulin. We can either draw insulin structure using three letter codes there's alanine, lysine, proline in this order, and then cysteine. Let's go look at cysteine structure. There it is, here's cysteine. Cysteine has a thiol group on its side chain. And remember how we can oxidize with Br2 or I2, and you can link sulfur to sulfur to make a disulfide bond or disulfide bridge. And you can cut that with zinc and acid, reduce it back. Well, nature doesn't use these reagents, but she can do the same thing. She has other oxidizing and reducing agents. And that's what she's done in insulin. She has one chain of amino acids, or one, sorry, one protein chain made of a whole bunch of amino acids a second protein chain up here, and she connected one chain to the other, and there's another loop here, um, through these disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges. The cysteine of one chain connects to the cysteine of the other through the thiol. And this is now one molecule. And it's kind of an important one. It's a signal to the cells to say, hey, start uptaking glucose out of the bloodstream. That's pretty big. But if you don't want such a big drawing, you can switch from three-letter codes to one-letter code. 
You have to look at this a little hard. Here, alanine's one letter code is an A. So here's the A around here. I hope lysine is a K and then proline is a P. <laughs> so anyways, the thiols should have helped you too. Here's the short one. It's right here, this one. Anywho, there we go. One letter and two letter codes you should be familiar with. I wouldn't ask you to draw out the structure of this, but maybe what I would do is I'd say, hey, tell me what the first three amino acids of insulin are. And I would give you this structure and I would give you this chart. And so, yeah, use the chart. Hey, what's which amino acid is the one letter code for A? You come over here and say, oh yeah, here it is. Here's A for alanine. Yeah. There you go. Okay, uh, what else we got here? Oh, last thing we're gonna end on, I think. Maybe there's a couple little notes at the end. Um, proteins. Okay, so we kind of got the heart of what a protein is. It's consisting of amino acids. And the identity, right? Are you doing alanine, 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 alanine? Are you doing alanine, lysine, proline? I think that's how insulin began. And the order is important, right? If you start with proline, then lysine, then alanine, that's not insulin. That's not gonna make insulin, that's gonna make a different protein. Okay, as we're having this discussion about, discussion about the protein, biochemists would say, we're discussing the protein's primary structure. The primary structure consists of, hey, which amino acids and in what order are you using to make these really, really long chains? But once you have these long chains, the same long chain can get into different shapes. They can form these alpha helices, and the same chain can also form these beta pleated sheets. Okay, so now you're talking about protein secondary structure. You have this huge, huge long chain, and within a segment of the chain is it wound up into a helical structure or this back and forth kind of pleated sheet structure. And if you're having that discussion about the protein, you're talking about its secondary structure. But now let's look at the whole chain all together. Okay, so here's a long chain, if you can see that. Zoom in, actually, I can zoom in for you. So I like this diagram here. It helps illustrate the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary. Okay, so if we look at this thread on the screen, this represents a protein molecule. And you can see right here, that this portion of the molecule has wound up into an alpha helix. What part of the molecule am I talking about? What aspect of the molecule? I'm talking about its secondary structure. How about right here? What's its secondary structure? It's kind of random. It's neither alpha helix nor is a beta pleated sheet. Um, what's the secondary structure right here? Ooh, that's looking like an alpha helix. If I ask you to describe the primary, um, primary structure, you say, I don't have that information. I don't know which amino acids are being used to make up this chain. Now, if I ask you to describe the tertiary structure, you'd say, oh, it's just kind of unfolded. It's just random. It's just out there in space. It's just a big thread. Whereas as we scroll to the right here, this is all coiled up. This is bunched up. It's kind of balled up. It's more of a blob. It's actually a term, it's a globular protein now. Wait, wait, you talking about primary structure or secondary structure? No, no, I'm talking about the whole molecule. It's now a big blob, a big ball. It's a globular protein. I'm talking about its tertiary structure. There you go. So it's different aspect of the same molecule. Okay. And so um, one other aspect, it's called protein folding. How does a molecule fold up? And there's other proteins called chaperones. I think that's what it is, chaperone, chaperones, like a chaperone, chaperone proteins, I forget the actual name. But there's other proteins, chaperone proteins, help the molecules, help these proteins fold up, get in the right shape. And if they're in the wrong shape, even if they have the correct number of amino acids, even if they have the correct, Alpha helix and beta pleated sheets, if they don't fold correctly, they don't function. So if insulin doesn't have the right shape, it won't tell the cell to uptake glucose. It won't function as insulin. 
So tertiary structure, primary structure, secondary structure are incredibly important, all are important to make a functional protein. Some aspects about tertiary structure. Um, those the cysteine that um, are used to make the disulfide bonds after it's gotten into its right shape and it helps it hold the shape. There's other things too. There's van der Waals or hydrophobic interactions that hold, you know, one side chain will stick to the side chain of a different amino acid in the chain, kind of hold things together. Things can hydrogen bond together, hold the molecule in its right blob shape if that's the globular protein is what you're getting. Um, tell me something about the secondary structure of this globular protein. Well, I see an alpha helix here and the interior is all beta pleated sheet. Tell me something about the tertiary structure. It's a big oblong globular protein. Tell me something about the primary structure. I don't know. The chain starts here and ends there and I can't see which amino acids are used to make the chain. If you have a protein, three-dimensional protein, that goes into a, um, like if it's a whole chain, the whole thing, turns out to be an alpha helix, so the whole thing does that. That makes a very straight molecule. And a lot of fibrous proteins consist entirely of that. So now when you talk about, hey, um, tell me something about the tertiary structure, you'd say, well, it's a fibrous protein. The tertiary structure, it's all straight. It's consisting of the secondary structure and alpha helix throughout the entire protein. Turns out fibrous proteins could be all beta pleated sheet too. They can just zigzag back and forth. And now the whole thing is kind of linear. The whole thing has a tertiary structure that's more of a fibrous protein. Oh, globular proteins, unlike fibrous proteins, are compact something somewhat spherical. They're soluble in water. Remember I mentioned the micelles before? So back when we talked about lipids, we said, hey, take the fatty acids, long carbon chains here with or without cystole bonds and carboxylic acid, make them anions, and then you have a polar head group with a long tail, and they'll get a whole bunch of these anions of fatty acids, throw them in the water, and then what that naturally do is they ball up where the carboxylic acids point towards the water, and these greasy tails hide in the middle to make a micelle. And this whole thing is soluble in water. This whole structure, three-dimensional structure, floats around water. Uh, that's how soap works. Uh, the greasy dirt goes in the middle, and this soap molecules kind of construct the micelle, allows this whole thing to go down the drain, stay dissolved in water. Proteins do the same thing. They ball up, so in the middle, all the non-polar side chains are hiding. And on the surface, you're gonna have amino acids. Okay, the protein's made up of amino acids, talking about primary structure. The amino acids that exist on the surface of the globular proteins should all have polar side chains. So the polar side chains can interact with the water and keep the whole protein dissolved. Very cool. So globular proteins are water soluble because their surface is hydrophilic, dissolves in water, and they can hide all the greasy um, non-polar stuff, waxy, oily, greasy stuff in the middle. The rest of their protein chains hiding away in the middle. Okay, you can also talk about quaternary structure. That's where you take one long protein chain and wind it up with a second or a third protein chain. So here's some, um, proteins found in the immune system, interleukin-8, it looks like, and by color coding, what is that, green and blue? Um, green is one protein chain, the blue is the other. Is this yellow here? That's a disulfide bridge that's connecting um, one part of the protein chain to another. So if I say, hey, this molecule on the screen, tell me about its quaternary structure. You would say, oh, there's two chains. That's how you would talk about its quaternary structure. If I say, hey, tell me something about its tertiary structure. Oh, you'd say, well, it's kind of oblong. It's kind of a blob. Is it sort of a globular protein? This thing looks kind of flat. Maybe it's more like a disc. You're talking about its three-dimensional shape. 
3D shape. If I say, tell me something about secondary structure, well, then you'd say, ooh, I clearly see two alpha helices. Ooh, and I think in the middle, yes, you do, there's a beta pleated sheet. Beta pleated sheet. And then if I say, tell me something about the primary structure, you'd say, sorry, I can't identify which amino acids are used to connect the chain, um, connect together to make the chains, the two chains. Here's hemoglobin. Tell me about its quaternary structure. Two chains again. There's an alpha chain and beta chain. Tell me about secondary structure. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if there's alpha helices in there. Um, look over in collagen. Tell me about its quaternary structure. Quaternary. Oh, there's three chains. Tell me about its secondary structure. Oh, there are alpha helices everywhere. Okay, tell me about its tertiary structure. It's a long fiber. It's just a long stick. Yeah, collagen is one of the connective tissues in skin. Cool. Okay, so now quaternary structure, tertiary, secondary, primary. Oh, here's the last few details. Take these globular proteins that dissolve in water, and if you unwind them, you heat them up, or you add an acid, like stomach acid, and um, you can disrupt the, the tertiary structure and not make them blob shape, make them open up. Well, now you've taken it out of its natural state. You've denatured it. So I need you to be familiar with that term. Denaturation is the process of disrupting the normal protein structure. And you do that all the time if you cook some eggs. We can take a raw egg, you'll look at its egg whites. Those are globular proteins. Add enough water, you can beat up the egg whites and they're mostly dissolved in there. The globular proteins are water soluble. But then when you fry them up, like in the picture here, um, those globular proteins open up and expose their nonpolar interior. And now the nonpolar greasy interior can't dissolve in water. And then you get this solid egg white. It doesn't dissolve anymore. It's been denatured. So what's changed? Has its primary sequence, a primary structure changed? No, you didn't. You know, there's these long chains were all balled up and now you spread them out. So then they turned egg whites, but the primary structure, the amino acids linking together, they didn't change. They're still linking together. It's just one long chain. Did the secondary structure change? Maybe, maybe it was maybe in here, there's some alpha helices and now alpha helices are gone or maybe they're still there. But what, what structure has definitely changed? Primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary? Definitely tertiary. It used to be a globular protein all balled up, but now its overall 3D shape is more random. It's opened up, it's not globular anymore, it's something else. Its tertiary structure has changed and that's why it's, a, you know, it's white when it's cooked and it's clear, egg whites are clear when they're in their natural state. Oh, and then proteins are pretty important. If you take all the water out of the cell, about half the mass consists of proteins. And so here's a whole bunch of names of specific proteins and what they do in the body. Lots of important things. But hey, it's been nice working with you. Send me an email. Hopefully I'll see you in class. That's all for now. I don't know if I'll see you in the next video, unless you take a different class. <laughs> take care. <laughs>